falsified, and then you need to make predictions. You, know, you take your uh, explanation and say, based on my explanation, this is what I would predict that researchers in philosophy, theology, and science would discover in their future research. And the point there is through predictions, you can guide further research. A good model also will be able to suggest research pathways whereby we can learn more and uh, develop a more detailed model and begin to uh, go after the anomalies that may not fit with the explanation. So would you say any robust model needs to have these various features? A robust model needs to have those features, and this is really helpful because in terms of the creation-evolution debates that have been taking place within the past few decades, there have been many participants who have been laying out charges you really don't have a model or that your model is not developed enough. And so, yeah, that is very much really to, to make any progress on these creation-evolution debates. We need robust models. All right, so we're talking about the RTB creation model now, but there are other players, Hugh. Maybe you can talk about them. Well, there are. I mean, you've got uh, the evolutionists and the creationists, but as I point out in Chapter 2, that's rather simplistic, because on the creationist side, uh, you've got uh, young Earth creationists, you've got old Earth creationists, you've got framework hypothesis of people, progressive creationists, uh, you have the theistic evolutionists, uh, you have concordists, and on the atheistic side, too, it's not all Darwinists. I mean, you've got people who take a punctuated equilibria perspective, a gradualist perspective. Uh, you've got people that claim that uh, there's some uh, hidden law in physics that self-organizes everything under natural process. So, yeah, it's not a monolith. I mean, you've got people claiming that life is brought here from uh, distant planets by intelligent aliens, the directed panspermia hypothesis of Francis Crick. And so I think when people realize that you're looking at a dozen different explanations, then it kind of takes it away from the battlefront perspective where you got two sides slugging it out until one's knocked out and one's declared the winner. No, it's much more complex than that, and it needs to be more complex than that. I mean, with any uh, scientific or theological enterprise, uh, you're really not making any progress unless you're developing new models all the time. Mm. And so it's never just one model against another model. And a good model will bifurcate and produce uh, models that are part of the family of the explanations. And this is the way that researchers can make progress, because then they can test one explanation against another explanation. There's nothing wrong with models being relatively close together. And particularly on the Christian side, we see that some of the models uh, are remarkably similar. Uh, Hugh, I wish you could define some of these terms. You introduced some nomenclature there. For those who may not be familiar with these various positions, maybe some of the major ones that you just talked about uh, in the creationist camp and the evolutionist camp. Well, I think most people are familiar with the young earth creationism. Those are, because they've been on the news, and they're the ones that are engaging all these political and legal battles. And uh, these are individuals within the Christian community. By the way, it's not just Christians. You also have young earth Muslims and young earth Mormons Mm. in addition to uh, young earth uh, Christians. Okay. Uh, But these are people who, based on the Bible, and keep in mind in Islam and Mormonism, they basically build on the Bible. They just have latter-day books. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, like the Christians who take a young earth perspective, they look at the days of creation in Genesis 1 as being six consecutive 24-hour periods. And typically they don't see very many gaps in the genealogies in the book of Genesis. And therefore, they would claim that uh, the universe has only been around for a few thousand years, uh, typically less than 10,000 years. There are some young Earth creations that go as far as 50, based on the gaps in the genealogies, but the vast majority would say somewhere between six and 10,000 years ago, we have God creating the universe. And so the origin of humanity is very close to the origin of, of the universe. Then you have the theistic evolutionists, who would say, yeah, the universe is 14 billion years old, and uh, things have changed with respect to time. But rather than God bringing about the changes through miraculous intervention, they would say that God brings about his desired outcomes by working behind the scenes through the natural process. Uh, Whereas you have uh, many old earth creationists, progressive creationists, who would take the position uh, that know that uh, God uh, supernaturally intervenes to bring about, say, the origin of life and all the species of life we see here on planet Earth, and also be supernaturally intervening in order to set up the physical environment for life and especially for uh, advanced life. 
Uh, but even in that camp, you've got a, a wide range of perspectives. Mm. Uh, there are people in the progressive creationist camp who would say, well, uh, there is some natural process. In fact, I think all old earth creations would argue that many of the changes are brought about by natural process. But there's a spectrum uh, where you have a great deal of miraculous intervention, such as what we posit here, reasons to believe, and those who would posit uh, little or almost no uh, miraculous intervention beyond what God did in creating the universe. And so you've got the gifted creationists, for example, who say that God gifted the universe with the capacity to produce all the changes that God would want, which is really more of a deistic perspective, uh, where God creates the universe 14 billion years ago, and all of his miracles and physical creation take place there. After that, the natural process he set up produces everything he wants. Mm. So, so, so people really need to know what is meant by the terms employed, and you lay that out uh, in detail in this Right, chapter. and for example, we're often labeled as concordus, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable. By the way, I'm uncomfortable with all the labels that people throw out for our position. Uh, you know, we're called progressive creationists, we're called old earth creationists, we're called concordus, and in some respects all of that's true of us, uh, but the way those uh, terms are used, I'm personally uncomfortable with every one of them, so I'm trying to figure out some way, and that's really what this book is all about. It really does define what the reasons to believe position is. Okay, what would you call it then? Well, I haven't come up with a term yet. Okay. Maybe you can come up you, with one for me, so, or so the those, readers can. So they those can suggest who, one. Those who have said that you're in the day age camp, you wouldn't say that's inaccurate. But what do you mean by well, that? Well, we are day age creationists. We do believe that uh, God progressively creates yes. uh, over billions of years. Uh, we do believe that He supernaturally intervenes. Uh, we are concordists in the sense that we believe that the two books that God has given us, the book of nature and the book of scripture, uh, totally agree that there's no contradiction between them. The reason why I'm uncomfortable with the term concordus is that labels usually put on people who read way more science in the Bible than is actually there. Mm. So, for example, we take the position that, that we should not read into the biblical text uh, technology and science that's beyond the time of the authors who are writing the Bible. Uh, so I'm very uh, much against the idea that, hey, here's a passage of Scripture uh, that's talking about Pi Masons. <laughs> okay. uh, Pi Masons is a term that's only familiar to 20th and 21st century readers. Mm. Uh, likewise, I take the position that the Bible is silent on the dinosaurs. Uh, because dinosaurs have only been known for the last couple of hundred years. Mm. You know, and uh, the way I read the Bible, it only uses terminology that's familiar to all generations that would be uh, writing it. So I'm in sympathy with those folks who critique Concordus for reading too much science into the Bible. On the other hand, I think there are those that are guilty of not reading enough science into the Bible. Mm. Uh, it's amazing to me how the Bible can use plain terminology to communicate rather advanced scientific ideas, and we shouldn't be blind to that. So in that context, uh, we are concordus. I mean, we do look for things like that. Okay. Do all these positions lend them, do all these models lend themselves to testing? Well, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I, I've argued that the problem with a lot of these positions is they've really not taken the time to develop a detailed, comprehensive model. So some of what I attempt to do in the book is basically do that for them. Now, uh, I've already gotten some complaints that I shouldn't be doing that. They need to be doing that. Mm. And I'm saying, well, look, I'm just trying to get you guys started. <laughs> yes. And, uh, Thank you for your help. <laughs> uh, you know, and maybe this would be some motivation uh, for them to develop a more detailed, comprehensive uh, explanation from their philosophical perspective. But no one's ever complained that I've been inaccurate in 